All right, I'm going to call the school committee business meeting for August 7th, uh, August 9th um, to order. It's uh, 631. First item of business is the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, next item is public comment. Uh, doesn't look like the public has come to comment yet. So there's a uh, further opportunity at the end of the meeting for them if they show up. Next item is acknowledgments. No. And we have no acknowledgments tonight, okay. <coughs> Moving on, ahead of our schedule here. Young Writers of America Poetry Contest. Katie McBrien. I'm Katie McBrien. I'm a sixth grade teacher here at the uh, Quashnip School, and I am on a team of three. So my student body uh, last year was approximately 63 students. I teach ELA. And last year, our 63 students participated in a poetry contest sponsored by the Young Writers of America. And I just wanted to give you a quick um, a uh, little brief background of who they are before we get into what this is all about. But as you can see, I have a guest with me here. We have the winner in our midst here, which is, and uh, what I, I, you know, teachers get a lot of things in their mailboxes, and, and there was a little flyer about this contest here. <coughs> and what I wanted to just uh, show you guys is what this group is all about, because there's a lot that we would just not acknowledge necessarily, but. They were, um, the Young Writers of the U.S. was established in 1991, um, and they have become a worldwide group. Uh, it started with a family-run business. Um, oh, thank you. It started with a family-run business um, with the Bonaccia family, and that got me uh, somewhat interested, so I, ch I checked them out. And uh, actually, they're right here. And when I read this first page here, I, it really resonated with me that their mission is to innovate and inspire, relish creativity, and they're, aren't, they're not afraid of change or failure. And I think that kind of set the tone for this, uh, this writing piece right here. So before, um, let's see. On their webpage for the particular contest that we entered, Nicholas was just made aware that he is presented here on their web page. Let's try that one more time. Here we go. Okay. So let me tell you a little bit about this contest, then Nicholas can actually share his poem with you. The contest was called Monster Poetry. One day in my classroom, I had the students just sit down without any introduction to this whatsoever. And they all had a blank piece of paper. They really spread themselves out wherever they wanted to be in the classroom, took a pencil, and I just asked them to draw a monster. Why, why are we doing that? What's that all about? And I said, don't worry about it. We're gonna have about a 15 minute quiet period. Just go ahead and draw a monster, whatever you envision in your mind. And so they did. And then this contest, or the assignment was actually introduced afterwards. And um, they kind of took what was a tangible visual into their piece that they ended up writing about. Um, this contest, as, let me just move this up here. Our first place winner was Nicholas. Um, in addition to winning this Northeast contest, he also was the winner of an iPad um, through this contest here, which was super, super exciting. So I'm going to move that down so that the the poem is not visible yet. But what I wanted to just share was that this turned out to be <coughs> a lovely piece of student children poetry that was open for grades four through eight, was it? Okay. Um, and I just wanted to share with you, because you don't have a book in front of you, 
there were students from Brockton and Fairfield, Sandown and Manchester, Springfield, Rowe, Salem, Foxborough, and on and on and on and on and on. And over 100, uh, close to 200 students entered. And out of our student body base of 63, we had something like 48 or so become published authors. And they got a beautiful certificate. And whether or not they chose to purchase a book, they're published authors. And they got the recognition, even if they don't own that, it's here in our library and here with our, um, with our teachers to reference in, in the, uh, our library here. So um, what I wanted to, uh, actually, if you want to read your poem um, now to the group, that would be nice. My poem is called The Beast. Be careful, watch out, it's coming, don't shout. It has seven eyes and makes you scream. I guess a good name could be ice cream. So arm, do not dream, not a good kind, not a good find. Multiple arms to the side your demise. Swords, hammers, and sparks that fly, be sure to cover your eyes. A sting of poison, a breath of fire, sure to scare. Just be careful not to burn off your hair. As scary and frightening as can be for each victim, he plants one tree. And out of the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of poems that were entered, there was, I believe it's on their website. What qualified Nicholas as a winner was great use of rhyming couplets and triplets good meter, the poem flowed really well, lovely use of description, the layout of the poem was visually appealing. So they had all of these things to consider when they were comparing Nicholas's to um, all the other students. In addition, lastly, um, they came back with word of who was admitted to the um, published book, but every other student had an opportunity to redo their poem again which I loved because they might not have made it in the first time for some reason. It might not have been in poetry format. One wasn't a monster, it was a sports figure. So it gave the kids a chance to do it again. That whole growth mindset about maybe I didn't get in the first time, but let me try again underneath the umbrella of the other company that's not afraid to take a chance or fail. So I love that about this group. Um, do you want to share your award? Uh, sure. And maybe you can just bring that up to show the. Congratulations, Nicholas. What was really fascinating was as we were announcing some of the students who were published poets at the year end awards assembly, and all the students came up, and we could see as a, as a, a staff body that the levels of students were all across the board. It was wonderful to just see how many students were um, successful in, the, in this contest in their very personal, personal way. Um, and what was really exciting was I was able to say, and the winner of the entire Northeast Region contest is in this class right now. And the kids just, <coughs> and then it ended up being the class. So congratulations. Did you get your iPad? Congratulations, uh, Nicholas, and uh, congratulations to you and to uh, all of the sixth graders who participated and uh, also to the uh, others who got published. Um, it, it's a great recognition and a great uh, program that you're doing. And, uh, now I understand why we have so many trees here on Cape Cod. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right, next item of business is approval of the minutes from June 21st. Mr. Chairman, I move to uh, approve the minutes of June 21st, 2017 as written. I second. There's no further comments. How do you vote? Yes. Yes. And yes. So it's unanimous. 
Next item is update on the uh, technology refresh plan. Uh, Sean Maroney is here. Hi. Hi. So it's a uh, much quick, quick update. Uh, we're still in the middle of the summer. I'm still working on things. Uh, <coughs> the computers uh, decided to uh, start in the year FY19 instead of this year. Um, and this is a discussion. This is just uh, we place 40 PCs each year, creating a six-year cycle. Um, it's based on the uh, 240 staff, which we keep, we hover around. Um, and I can currently get a complete setup of around $800, keeping the cost to approximately $32,000 annually, which actually would fit inside my operational budget. Um, on the Chromebooks, I plan on continuing the current refresh <coughs> plan, which is basically purchasing the difference between the incoming class and the outgoing class, um, and then replacing all the ones that are just beyond economic repair, where we usually just take apart and use parts for. Um, which usually amounts to around anywhere between, well, the past two years have been 100, but it, it can be less or more. Um, that's about it for the update. Mm. Do you have any questions about that or any suggestions? What's the approximate cost of like 100 Chromebooks? Uh, the Chromebooks I currently get for around 240, so that's around. So uh, I had um, sent Sean an email uh, with a couple questions. Um, one, which he just affirmed here, was um, in regard to the uh, number of Chromebooks that you're purchasing, and uh, I had asked how many and what the dollar amount uh, was uh, expected for FY18. Um, and Looks like a, about 126,000 in total cost. Is that correct? If I'm interpreting your email correctly. For, For FY18. Was just the Chromebooks? Yes. Right. So, so, is that not what I said? You said 120. You said 120. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> a little different. A little different. <laughs> 26,000. Yes. Okay. You just check and make sure you're right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Which is approximately the same amount as, as uh, FY17. Yes. That's what <coughs> you indicated. And, and part of the reasons why I'm sticking with the plan and not moving forward is um, HP just came out with a, basically it's a hardened Chromebook specifically for education. So I'm, I'm hoping that uh, this year's or next year's cycle, having moved these into the system, uh, I won't lose as many or have to repair as many or be able to you know, the, the number should drop on the repair side. Okay. Um, I'd ask you also to check with um, um, the town, with Dave Del Vecchio. Yes, uh, Dave, Dave answered me and he said uh, that they keep it within the operational side. Okay. They only about 35, uh, computers in the year, so. Okay, so the town and the school both um, do PC replacement we through the operational through budgets the versus through the, but servers are done through the capital uh, budget, if correct? If replace multiple servers, yes, it would be capital. The, the, the cutoff is $25,000 before it becomes um, eligible to put through capital. Okay. And you're still working on the um, iPad rep uh, refresh plan, correct? Yes, that's done. Okay. Any other have questions? I'm oh, good. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. Thank All right. Thank you. <coughs> Next item is handbook revisions. Several here on the page five. Um, I'll ask that we 
um, vote on each of them separately. Well, vote on the first two together and then the last one separately. Okay? So I'll turn it over to you, Superintendent. So the handbooks have been updated with the suggested changes from the last meeting, and then this is additional wording um, that is now in all of them about uh, through our automated communication system, a parent guardian will receive a phone call and or email when a decision is made to cancel school or delay the opening. And it is important that a parent guardian's contact information, phone number, and email is always kept up to date in our data management system so that they can get those. That's in all the books. And then um, we realized there really wasn't anything that addressed volunteers in any of the handbooks. And this was sort of related to the Corey at the Coombe School. So they're all adding, in advance of volunteering in the Mashpee Public Schools, a volunteer must have a valid quarry on file at the superintendent's office and must also complete a volunteer application, which can be found at our on our district's website. Volunteers will be issued an ID badge or visitor pass, which must be worn at all times while on school premises. And it is important for all volunteers to respect confidentiality, to be punctual, and to communicate with the teacher or main office staff if unable to volunteer. And then the last piece on this is specific just to the Coombs School. At the Coombs School, a current Cori application is required if a parent guardian or other adult guest wishes to participate in certain school day events that occur throughout the school year, including but not limited to field day, seasonal walk, chaperoning on a field trip, and kite day. A Cori is not required to attend school day assemblies, most classroom presentations, or evening family events. If you are unsure if a quarry is required, please check with the main office in advance of the event. Questions or comments on any of these? I have a question. Uh, for the Coombe School one, because mm -hmm. I've been at a couple of field days, and so now every parent that comes to field day has to have a quarry? That was that way this year. I'm pretty sure I was in violation of that then. You, How is that going to be enforced? Well, you might have had a valid quarry <laughs> on file. How is that going to be enforced? Well, they're going to give out, you'd have to have some kind of a, um, either the badge or the visitor pass. They have an up-to-date record of everyone who's quarried from our office. It's given to them all the time. But we're talking about the thing that happens outside on the fields. Yeah, but you just can't show up. You have to check in. Could you, you know. just show up? <laughs> <laughs> that's a side conversation. Well, <laughs> I, no, I just, I'm not sure that that's practice. clear. It was or probably very unclear this year. Yeah. We're hoping to continue to provide clarity because it's new for that age. Group. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so we should probably make the people aware of that outside of just the handbook. I'm yes, he this. should include it at open house. He, I believe it's in some of his, but you get them, his yeah. weekly. Okay. Emails. Yeah. It was in the one right before field day. Okay. But it should probably go on a flyer of any kind of information. Yeah, it should it always should consistently always be, be displayed. It's, it's, yeah. it's relatively yeah. new. Mm -hmm. I don't think you were in violation. And the same with the <laughs> fun run. You know when he did his big fun run this year? Yes, he said, I asked about that, the boost-a-thon thing? Yeah. That, he felt, was different because the parents were kept they weren't part of the fun run. They were kept to the sides. They weren't as in integrated with the kids. Okay. That was what he told me. All right. Mm -hmm. I just want to make sure I understood it. I mean, I, I, I do know that that did cause um, quite a few comments the last couple of uh, years um, in regard to lack of clarification of what was the requirement. I guess the, uh, uh, the question is the diligence in checking um, people in um, to make sure that they do have uh, or have completed a quarry um, because I think to Nicole's um, defense and, and probably others that I've seen just walk, walk in and uh, participate, particularly in the outside uh, events. There's not a, a, yeah. a real way to, right. to um, prevent someone from doing uh, that. Um, I, personally, I struggle a little bit with um, 
balancing the, the risk and the, um, the need, um, particularly if they're right out there in the playground, <coughs> um, you know, for the, the walk up to the turkey walk, I think it was. That was the first, I think, that it sort of kind of bubbled surfaced. up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I guess I could understand that because, uh, you know, the kids were behind the building, through the woods, and so forth, and, and it would be a little more challenging uh, for the um, teachers and administration to monitor uh, what was going on in, uh, during those walks. Um, but <coughs> when it's right out there on the playground, I, I struggle personally um, to see the difference. But I mean, if we're going to do this, there needs to be a more efficient way to making sure that message is communicated and that the people know that they have been um, uh, quarried. Um, do we send them anything afterwards? <coughs> Right, but once you've done it, do you receive anything from the school that well, says you get a badge? You get a badge. If you're out in the playground without a badge or a pink badge, or thing, a visitor you're pass, not, you know, for, according to us. You know. But that's based upon having that person check all the time. Ch check in at the um, school yeah. office, right? Yeah. Well, I, I hope we're not going to be escorting grandparents off the premises because they don't have quarry checks. I'm just saying it's, I can see why we haven't had in the handbook, but I'm real curious to see how we enforce this. <laughs> so. People are pretty good about coming in to get the quarry because it doesn't take very long and it's a very short application. So we really haven't had any. It can be done in about 10 day. minutes yeah. now, correct? Yeah. yeah, it was about 10 minutes, I think, is what yeah. it takes, right? Um, yeah. so I mean, what I'd like to see if it were a field day and you yeah. had people show up who weren't, maybe there's sort of a, an audience not fenced in sure. kind of thing, but yeah. where you could still watch from a distance versus really getting involved with. Or some quarry kids. forms at the door. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it still takes time <laughs> through the system. Yeah. So, but to, to go through. <coughs> well, anyway, I there. think the people in this room and the people that you're used to dealing with are not the people I'm thinking would be unaware of that policy. Yeah, I'm thinking right. generally of sort There's of, confusion. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. So, uh, so I guess ultimately, does the principal, the principal though, has discretion, correct? To waive somebody's, yes. To to allow them, mm -hmm. to to participate. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. Can that be incorporated into the policy then? Okay. That the building principal well, has. Uh, discretion or ultimate uh, uh, authority over this yeah well it would, it's implied because it's his building and he's in control but um, because if you say building principle basically is discretion to waive that requirement then that kind of like and all of a sudden you have them showing up because yeah. they didn't listen to his email right. for the first yeah. four weeks and then that's kind of I think it's fine as it is Don it's just um, like I said, I understand why we have to put it in the handbook. I just. Well, we just need to make sure that it gets communicated multiple times over mm -hmm. and over again yeah. so that mm -hmm. people don't show up and find out that they didn't go through this. Yeah, you might as well just start passing out. I mean, I remember we got our first one when we were in the kindergarten open house or something. You know, when you yeah. come in for that yeah. first meet and greet, mm -hmm. but I think. It really just needs to be, you will not be able to participate in any <coughs> Coombe School events unless you have one of these on file. That wasn't, it definitely wasn't put to me that way three years ago, so I think we just need to be maybe clear in that orientation piece. And it's only a change as of last year. Uh -huh. yeah, so. yeah. And I think what really happened was there was, because uh, this, the middle one here is already a policy. Mm -hmm. We set that, what, two years ago when we were doing the fingerprints and all that? Yeah. So I think what happened was there was some bleed over into what is considered volunteering and what's considered mm -hmm. just attending yeah or attending so it seems like there was some bleed over there and, and uh, you know it's the principal's building so i think he wants to consider all this stuff now volunteering and not just uh, <coughs> you know, being there to mm -hmm. attend okay 
Thanks. That's what it seems like to me. Anyway. Yeah. I don't want to put words in his mouth. <laughs> Where is Paul? <laughs> I see Mrs. O'Brien over there. Paul's <laughs> too busy to come to our meeting, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I am going to uh, let him know that. <laughs> We had the discussion today. <laughs> like, are you coming? I think you make a valid point, though, in regard to volunteering, that the differential is that they're actually volunteering to be part of the, the program. Yeah. I think Chris made that point. Yeah. Yeah. So if that's. What jumped out at me was that if you wish to participate, not volunteer, but if you wish to participate, you have to have a Corey on file. I was like, wow, it's kind of hardcore. <laughs> right, but in this case, it, it, we're basically saying they're volunteering. We're treating them as volunteers. Oh, well, I, I think that's what Chris is suggesting, but Paul's not here to ask, but I think that's what the implication the is. Yeah. Is that the... Yes. So, so... That's what he told me. Okay. When my husband had to get Corey before field day, and he came in and got his picture taken. <laughs> <laughs> it took five minutes, and yeah. he actually got an ID before yeah. I did. <laughs> he enjoyed it. He was, he's very proud. Um, yeah. But, yeah, I think, again, it's just the publication of it, and mm -hmm. Mr. LaBelle does those awesome weekly newsletters that he emails to <coughs> families and if he can just be kind of a give every week it's in there as kind of a standard mm -hmm. but then when there is field day coming or kite day coming he highlights it in bold again teachers right. are sharing it with the kids we just all need to yeah. put it on social you know facebook and twitter and right. tell people yeah just remind him yeah uh, all right yeah. okay i'm good don you good mm -hmm. are you good no, i'm good all right. Do I have a motion to approve? Um, I guess we can do all three of them together uh, if there are no changes. Uh, all th do I have a motion to approve all three addendums uh, to the um, hand school handbooks? Yeah, I'll, I'll move to um, accept the additional wording to the handbooks for the 2017-2018 school year. That sound right. Second. Okay. Hearing no further discussion, how do you vote? Yes. Yes. And yes. So it's unanimous. Okay. okay. Next item is the uh, report of the superintendent. So we have an update on personnel. You have a sheet in your packet. A uh, little bit of a change from what you have in front of you. Um, but anyway, we have hired uh, Jenny, Jennifer Kenny as a Title I reading teacher at the Coombe School. This is updated since our last meeting. Um, your chart does show a Samuel Costa as a music teacher at the Quashnet School. In the end, he accepted a position closer to his home in Somerset. Um, and then Danielle Burton is a math teacher who is at the Mashpee Middle High School. Um, we had three resignations since the last meeting. We had Patricia McGrory, who was a recess monitor at Quashnet. Christina DeLumba is a paraprofessional at Mashpee Middle High School. And Lisa Holmes is the health and family consumer science teacher at Mashpee Middle High School. We do have um, a couple of shifts and a couple of hires since this sheet was printed. We do have a new English teacher at Mashpee Middle High School. Her name is Brianna Drake. She came on board yesterday and then also for the health family consumer science teacher at the middle high school, William Stolowski. He also came on board yesterday. And then the Elena Sheehan Boyd is shown under the Coombe School as a halftime music teacher, halftime Title I. Um, based on a reduction in our funding for Title I of about 40,000, she is being shifted to the full time music slot at the Quashnet School. So we will have a halftime music opening at the Coombe School that is yet to be filled. And then in the, um, the other shift is there was a special ed there is a special education teacher at the Quashnet School, Anna Strone, and she is moving to the middle high school for um, a particular program. So in the box you see that we still have a special ed teacher for Quashnet. 
We are still looking for the dean for the Mashpee Middle High School grades 10 through 12. Um, we're adding the halftime music teacher at the Coombs School. And then there are five paraprofessional positions unfilled, although most of the interviews have taken place. There are three at the Coombs School, one at the Quashant School, and one at the Middle High School. So that is where we are at as of today. Okay. Great. Any yeah. questions? Okay. okay. You have the next page in the packet is an update on the school choice, our second window um, closed. So you'll see the seats enrolled as of August 1st, 2017 in the middle column for a total of 43 new students to the choice program. And then you'll see in the third column the seats that will remain open throughout the school year. If a situation arises and someone um, needs or wants a seat at one of those uh, grade levels where we have an opening, they will apply through the school choice program application and then um, in most cases probably receive that seat. In overall total, when you look at the choice students we had this year, in total we had 70. We lost three seniors who graduated and when looking over the list, two students moved. So those 65 with this 43 is 108 choice students. Do you have any questions on that chart? So um, based on this note at the bottom, the asterisk, so we, mm -hmm. we had to turn away <coughs> seven? Well, we would have turned away five in, in kindergarten, yes. And then so six applications were in grade one. We took five, so that's one more. And then in grade 10, there was one. Yeah, okay. But we still have plenty of seats in sixth grade, so. <laughs> <laughs> not, not sure why we're not getting those filled, but okay. Any other questions? No, we filled four. There's ten. There's a lot of them. I know. Yeah. There's a lot of them. Okay. Okay. Good. Next is an update on Camp Falcon. The final day for Camp Falcon for 2017 is tomorrow. And um, just gathering, thank you to Beth Wonder for gathering some quotes today from the participants. Um, I'm just going to share some of them from students. This was a third grader. My two favorite camps were board game, brigade, and farm to table. In board games, we played life and clue. In farm to table, we learned how the environment, food, and cooking are connected, and we made scones. In a fifth grader says that I loved one-act plays because we could be crazy and silly. <laughs> Another fifth grader, my favorites were scrapbooking and one-act plays. I love crafting, and I like the improvisation part of one-act plays. Another fifth grader said, I love fun and fitness because I like to move and be active. And then overall, some highlights. The campers learned how to reuse and recycle items to create beautiful art. They picked vegetables from our school garden to make delicious dishes and farm to table, including vegetable sushi. I think that was yesterday. Students learned about sea life here on Cape Cod and were able to see a live horseshoe crab up close. Students worked together to improvise a play that they performed for an audience at the end of each week. Campers use Legos to make movies in stop motion movies and a 3D printer to bring their creations to life in 3D drawing. Students showed up each day full of enthusiasm and left excited, maybe not today, to share what they had learned. <laughs> Staff and students thoroughly enjoyed Camp Falcon and the attendance this week was 55, which they had anticipated being the last week it would be a little less, but um, it's holding strong compared to last year. Yeah. yeah. So do we have any plans to evaluate <coughs> the, um, the camp with parents, you know, send out some sort of survey to ask for? Yeah, we could do, we'll do a Google form. I know last year we didn't survey the students. We did have a debriefing with the uh, teachers to find out what worked and what didn't from their perspective, but um, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Can we get a total number of kids that attended across all programs, so yeah. kids times programs sure, to get. I can certainly get that. I think it was like 113 that actually registered. 
Right, but times actually, yeah. actually attended times the number of programs that, that just to get some sense of. We have all that. Mm -hmm. took attendance every day. Just for that purpose, for the data, really. Okay. Mm -hmm. Some kids sign up and don't get <coughs> so. Yeah. All right. Okay, update on the Quashant School Project. So Mrs. O'Brien and I had a lovely three-hour meeting today <laughs> <laughs> to look at plans, to look at plans the size of the table, 60 pages of them. Um, so anyway, this was sort of the 60% cost estimate submission stage. There was another meeting scheduled for August 17th to review the cost estimate for the plans after some tweaking from today. Um, the architects and engineers did say that they had to change cost estimators, the cost estimator, which delayed a little bit because of some family um, issues that the person had. Um, so the MSBA has approved the maximum amount, and they anticipate the finalized plans will be less in terms of the overall budget. Um, on the 17th, we are going to review the budget again. They will have developed phasing for how they're going to lay this out. Specifics on color selection, uh, confirming the doors, and other noted changes from today will be reviewed again, including the addition of window shades in the classrooms. Um, Mary Kate will be working with them to work to create a work plan with some swing rooms, is what they call, to allow the movement to take place. The town will be hiring a construction manager at risk, which I guess is something that. Um, it's better for the town because it gives us input on any additional requirements that we want to put on a subcontractor. It doesn't end up resulting in any additional money. There's monies in there, they said. So the subcontracts will go out for electric, plumbing, mechanical, the windows, and the roof. And by having this construction manager at risk, we get to mm -hmm. pick the subcontractors and also add additional qualifications. So it is a plus for the town to go with this model. The construction manager at risk generally gets about 2% of the construction cost as a fee. Um, they guarantee the um, project comes in at or under budget and also within the time frame that is established. That's a whole DPW side of okay. things. So bids are going out in November. Uh, next summer, this will be a construction zone. No one can be in this building. So my office area will be probably relocating themselves temporarily to the high school, and I believe the Quashin administrator will go to the Coombs School guidance area um, because we really can't be here. And then the hope is, even though the project sort of shoulders before summer and after, we prefer all the shouldering to be at the end of uh, the 17-18 school year versus interrupting two years. So we're going to try to do our best to accommodate that plan um, and have it be sort of a finished project before we open schools for the 18-19 year because we don't really want it. They, they will come in, the company <coughs> will cover everything. Uh, everything has to be off the walls, but you know, there's whatever, 40 years of dust in these sailings, so it's going to be um, unpleasant. Uh, so the next meeting, which will probably be, didn't you block off the whole day for that? Yes, yes I believe you did. <laughs> um, we'll really Smart. be sort of laying out um, the plan so that we can really, you know, we'd like to go full, full boat at April vacation on. It just depends because some things will sound like a jackhammer and that's not going to be good. On the roof. Oh, like a, a dental drill, actually. <laughs> so um, that is the update. <coughs> All right. So All right. That, that next meeting is the 17th? That is the 17th at 8.30. All right. Yeah. So General if you'd like question. to come. Yep. Um, I would assume that the plan is to move Camp Falcon to KCC next year? So that has not, we haven't talked about that, whether it would be there or at the high school. Okay. We had at the high school, we probably could use some of the technology up there. It's not a bad idea. And, you know, it's littler over there. It's, you know. Yeah. <coughs> and the rec department camp has to be somewhere, so they're going to be over there, too. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. The hard part, too, will be readying the building mm -hmm. for the 18-19 school year in terms of the DPW cleaning schedule. And, mm -hmm. you know, so that's another thing we have to work on. 
they did make the suggestion of a swing space being the locker room, which Mrs. O'Brien was not too keen on that being made into classroom area back there. <laughs> it's, no, I, I can't. <laughs> <coughs> if it results in something that's permanent that we get that's left behind for us to use, but because they will do things, so. Yeah. <laughs> but they are very focused on um, being respectful of Mary Kate and her concern with learning. So that's a good thing. They good. understand that they will work around. They can do nights and whatever. So. Well, n n nights and weekends are included in the budget, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that was mm -hmm. part part of it. Right. Yeah. All right. Well, very interested to hear the schedule. Yes. And then the last thing in my um, report is the DPW equipment rental. So Hope and I met yesterday with Don Thayer. It was yesterday, right? Yeah. I think it was yesterday. With Don Thayer and um, Catherine Laurent and went over everything. And Don, through the rental, the rental account, will set up sort of a side um, piece for us. What we have to do before we actually lay it out is sort of come up with what would be the reasonable charge. We, we would focus on classroom technology, auditorium technology, or gymnasium technology, like the scoreboard. Mm -hmm. But you have to basically come up with the cost, how long the life of it, how many um, you know, outsiders using it to come up with something reasonable. We're not supposed to make money on the deal, so we'll, we'll work on that. It's really the auditorium is the big one. Yeah. So. OK. So yeah. it's M more to, more to come on that. It's a work in progress, yes. All right. Next That's item, uh, before we move on to the next item, any other questions uh, for the superintendent? No? All right. Next item is unfinished business, the mask policy manual update proposal. So in your packet is the... Uh, So, do I understand correctly, this was an unsolicited proposal, correct? We did not reach out to them? Oh, no, we, reach, we, we reached we out did? to this. We uh did? -huh. Okay. Yes. I wasn't aware of that, but okay. <coughs> All right. It was because we were curious. We started thinking that we would meet regularly and review our policy manual, and but um, Gail Hannon pointed out in 2012, I think was the last time, and that it's, you know, well worth this um, approach because they um, sort of know everything that's the latest, uh, any changes in making sure our policy book is inclusive and complete. And you can, it's a, you can spread it out, it's a $10,500 fee but spread out over three years. So who was here the last time we did this? Don, were you here? Uh, I think it, it was, was 2012. I don't think. I think it was. I think they were just completing it. Mm -hmm. um, Scott. Mm -hmm. When I joined, because I know that there was a significant rewrite of all the policies um, and streamlined a, a lot of what, uh, a lot of the verbiage from what previously was in there, because th they used to put everything plus the kitchen sink uh, in them, and uh, they got narrowed down uh, a lot. Um, what's that? Right, and, and they, they had it in, as, as I recall, they had it in Word. Um, <laughs> So you guys believe this is warranted? Um, I, I've, you've gone through the experience, mm -hmm. and you can comment on that. Yeah, <laughs> district. Um, we just jumped into this this year and did exhaustive research. One of the school committee members is an attorney, so she had real strong questions about spending the money when she's an attorney, and she, she's amazing and can do a lot of this. But what really sold her, she spoke to the guy at MASC, and got a lot of questions answered. And what spoke to me was the, your policies are your protection. 
And so these, this is what they do. So you know you're covered in terms of what we have to have in our policies for kids, for families, for staff um, by <coughs> doing it. And to me, that is money well spent because we're not attorneys. You know what I mean? So um, it, we went with it, and I think everyone is super pleased with what the outcome has been. Again, in another another town. So, so was that the first time that they had done it? Though? In that town, yes. In that town. Yeah. And most, like I said, most of the, the four were way on board, but the one who was an attorney was like, well, this is what I do, <coughs> like, and that's why I can volunteer, and I feel like it's what I bring to the table. They will still open their policies just as they always had. So you still have local control over your policies. What they do is make sure they give you what needs to be in there, and then you still open it and take a look and see what, if you want to make changes, it's still up to you. You don't have to go with what they say. But at least you know when a bullying change, a harassment change, something comes down, some mandate, you know it's going to get covered. So that's my 12 so, cents. A uh, question, Don? Yeah. Um, so you may or may not know from your experience, but uh, when they go through it, if there are state level uh, policies and say some of ours are out of date, do they replace it or do they just give you a laundry list of stuff that you need to do? No, they do the work and have it all set for you, yeah. but then you still have the option well, yeah, to go in and do what you and want. And on the local <laughs> level, obviously, that's on us. They don't know what our local policies right. are, but on the state level, it's the same for everybody. Exactly. So I was hoping that if they're going to charge yes. they need to at least. They do. Yeah, okay. They do. And if you want, I know people I know from that other mm -hmm. district would be happy to talk with any of you, particularly the um, person who was the attorney if anyone is questioning or concerned she could at least answer some of those questions but I know at MASC they'll do it for you as well yeah. they'll answer anything you because it is a lot of money yeah you know but well, I guess a question I have is how how often is it recommended that you go through this no I think it's an ongoing service well but this is I mean there's they're basically spreading the cost through 2020 so for the next three physical years so I wouldn't assume one I, I don't assume that it's going to take three years for them to complete it but I guess I'm unclear in regard to are we basically hiring them for three years and that if there are changes that take place during that three-year period they would bring those forth to the committee or is this a one-shot deal which I believe is what happened the last time um, and then they kind of disappear Are you asking me yes okay so what I, I think I don't know no what I think my my record because I sort of tuned out at this part of the meeting I'm not gonna lie because <laughs> it didn't really apply to me but what I think was that that upfront cost that yeah. you know 10-5 is to do the big big kahuna right to do right. everything and you can spread it out over the three years because they understand budgets but I think then there's an ongoing cost to continue that service in terms of updates that is not anywhere near that same price mm -hmm. do you know what I'm saying but again I think where I came from we looked at policies differently and that we opened and maybe you do that here I don't know we didn't look at policies all at once we had certain months where we opened certain policies based on when we had to. So it wasn't, if you're talking about a big project you did in 2012 or before you, yeah, that's not how it happened with where I was. But what it says here is they're going to take all your current policies, they're going to put them together, they're going to codify them, make them the way they need to be, and then work with you on what you want them to ultimately look like. Right. Do and then there's ongoing. PD, you know, there's ongoing support. I, I mean, this sounds to me like a repeat of what was done, I guess, in 2011 or 12. And my my question is, do we need to at this point? I mean, it's been what five years. Do we need to to um, invest the money to do this at, at this point? Um, and then ultimately, you know, as with anything, it comes out of date is before the ink is dry. 
you know, I'd much rather, I, I guess I personally, you know, to me there's two options. You either do the big thing and spend your money there, or you do more of an incremental um, effort, which is what I've heard a lot of districts do, which is I think what you were just alluding to, which is kind of a rolling cycle. Mm -hmm. So through the year they cover yeah, every they month to, there's they, maybe three, it depends on the schedule, right. but maybe three policies that get opened. Right. And then if they don't finish it that month, they'll say, oh, I need to cover, you know, I need to put it to the next month or whatever. But yeah, that's, that's kind of a rolling cycle versus, yes. I, I believe our practice has been once it's done, it's done until mm -hmm. something occurs that we have to reopen it. Is that oh. a fair assessment? I, I'm not on the policy committee, so I'll, I'll defer to you. We just got you. put on the policy committee <laughs> a couple months You're ago. You're looking but at the <laughs> yeah. And the time that I've gone to any policy meetings, it was based on something that we needed to address, address the mm -hmm. policy. Right, v versus a uh, ongoing review. I so, think, sorry, I was just going to say, I think it would be, um, good to find out from those who might have been here what was done in 2012 because and then push this you know off in terms of coming back with a little more information and also to find out if there's ongoing yeah, support, support after if you do it mm -hmm. one big shot then what's the ongoing support I am 90 percent sure that there is again for a smaller fee yearly right. Right, but I don't think we're paying that now. No, so that's what. So, you know, so, 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 you know, part of the question would be, shame on us, when we did this last time, should we have been paying for that ongoing quote unquote maintenance, so that we don't have a, a bigger nugget to deal with? Um, and you wouldn't think that we had a huge nugget because you know it's only been five years. So if our book was brought up to date. At that point, um, you know, certain yeah, ones, yes. Yeah, certain ones, obviously. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it was a significant change last time. Right, it was very. Uh, it's a big book. Did we use them as it was well, bigger. Yeah. <laughs> oh, same, same gentleman. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. I, I, I mean, personally, I, I wouldn't mind having Mr. Hardy make an appearance at a future meeting if, if the rest of the committee would like that? Well, I guess I don't, I mean, I guess that would be fine, but what's missing, I think, is the rationale for the proposal. So we're looking at their proposal, but why did we request it? When was the last one we did? What did we spend? What did we get? Why do you feel that we need this? Because as a school committee member, if you tell me that we need this, then I'm I'm probably going to defer to you, uh, to your judgment, but I don't see anything in this packet that explains to me why you requested the proposal or what we think we need help with. I think it was uh, feeling like I wanted to start going through on a monthly basis a section of the policy manual with the policy committee just so that we are looking and know everything that's in there. And then in a conversation with Gail, she said, well, they have, you know, the service that does that with you and they have all the latest, they have a better knowledge base maybe of what's, what's changed in a policy. Um, so that's where it started. I really kind of did want to just, you know, go through it, but, um, but we can kind of get some more information on it. Okay. Yeah. Because that's 44 Chromebooks that we wouldn't get to buy if we spent mm. that money. <laughs> so I don't know. I was just thinking it might be, uh, Good to know. Yep. Yeah, so uh, it, it's probably a good idea anyway with the, uh, without the other two members here to take oh yeah, no, yeah. yeah. it. Yeah. I'm not set, ready to make it. It is set uh, for a vote, but I think. Um, I, yeah, I think know, voting on anything that's going to cost money without the other two members is probably not a good idea. No. And, and you know, <coughs> worst case scenario, um, MISC will be at the. Uh, conference in uh, November. Yes, November. It might be nice to hear uh, from other districts like us. Yeah. Yeah. So um, we'll, we'll table Good this until uh, the next meeting. We'll have a further discussion. Okay. All right. Moving on under uh, new business. 
Not sure why it's under new business, but um, the uh, wellness policy, second read and vote, and I had an email from Mr. Gorman. What did I do with it? Um, who was not able to attend tonight. Um, my only comments are for the wellness policy as I would like s some more meat inclu included regarding recess requirements. I know we utilize recess to ensure we are providing adequate time to the PE requirements for students, but we do not document exactly what we are doing. I have some serious issues about removing students from recess for discipline and some special instruction periods. I do not know if this is occurring at other schools, but it is at Quashnet. I think that recess time should be involved, and I would like to have a discussion about it. Unfortunately, he's not here. Not only is removing recess time bad for the students, but also limits their lunch time. I've witnessed kids coming in from recess specials routinely showing up 10 minutes late for what really is a 20 minute uh, lunch period. So he wanted to make sure that uh, this was brought up. Uh, I did forward this to you. Could, could I ask Mrs. O'Brien, Principal O'Brien, to address that since it's um, very public at this point <laughs> and deserves her response? Because it is in the policy. Yeah. Yeah. And bold print. lunch period is 25 minutes. Um, so the only specials that we do have during any recess block would be for fourth, fifth, and sixth graders who receive either band instruction or strings. So it's instruments. And they have it once in a six day <coughs> cycle. We really do not have another time during the day to provide those currently about 190 students who participate in the band and the strings program. So to put those three days after school, it would be too many students to be able to accommodate them. So the only time to offer that is during that recess block or they would be losing core instruction. And we cannot have that interfered with. Um, so unless there's some suggestion of time we just have looked at that schedule repeatedly and to be able to find alternate time to offer that I just can't see it the morning is not really an option because it's not equitable to all students where we don't have the early transportation for all students so there are some lessons that are offered from 8 to 8 30 but still we're trying to accommodate almost 200 students with lessons for whether they're taking viola, cello, uh, the French horn, whatever the instrument is. In terms of um, any type of discipline, we do try to certainly avoid any recess time. There are times, however, that we have had students do a community service. And what that means is if it, there's an altercation at recess, then they use that next recess outside usually to help the school community in some way. So there's some kind of movement, there's some activity. They're not sitting in a classroom, they're not sitting in the office. Every effort is made to avoid that. Um, we also don't like to do an after school type detention because then after the whole day in the afternoon, then they're sitting and that's not productive for students either. In terms of coming in late or any other type of um, recess delay, sometimes lunch bunches can get out a little bit late. <coughs> and I'm not really sure what Mr. Gorman, I wish he was here so I could um, answer his question. But sometimes they do come back a little bit late from a lunch bunch scenario, and that overlaps into another grade level lunch, so it could look like they're coming in late. But because of the serving of food, we have to be pretty much on time. But we do value that students get outside, they're moving, um, they're out of the labyrinth, they're, they're doing a lot. And there are occasions where we have had to um, 
change students recess maybe there was an issue with another student whatever um, there are times we alter those recess times but so they still are getting outside for that physical activity it's critical that they do get that and is there anything specific to completing makeup work or we, I know in the years past parents would do a sign off giving yes. permission because we wouldn't keep them in occasionally students will have to stay in and meet with the teacher for five minutes ten minutes maximum for a 25 minute recess so that is used at times but it is with the parents knowledge and approval often we have more parents calling requesting that the students stay in to make up that work during recess <coughs> but we have to constantly say and, and we do that no it is really important to have that break during the day as well but that 10 minute time five to ten minute window is utilized on occasion yes thank but you certainly not an entire recess thank you for the uh, music portion as well if I'm not mistaken parents sign off on that too, that's correct. part of participation in the music program, yes. Mm -hmm. And that's spelled out so when parents sign whatever form, it's spelled out saying yes. your child will miss recess. And we do on occasion have students not participate because they're not willing to give mm -hmm. up that recess, but that is a parent's decision. Okay. Right? Yes. Thank you. But they can't participate in a concert without that instruction, so <laughs> it, they have to weigh what's most important for their mm -hmm. child. Mm -hmm. And to reinforce, too, what's nice about being in Mashpee is that we provide lessons, very small group um, instrumental lessons for students in grades four, five, and six, and then they're ready to go and pr do the work on a daily basis when they get to the middle, middle school. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty nice. But, and uh, chorus is in there, too, right? Don't you miss recess if you do chorus? No. no. Oh, chorus it's just is done just during special. Okay. Yeah. So, it's, so what you're saying, to address Jeff's point, is that the the recess block for every six day is used for band so those Less, kids not band in total string no. lessons no lessons oh. by instrument oh. so lessons. if we lessons. have oh. trumpet players we yeah. have drum percussions whatever that instrument is then the music teachers divide those students up by that instrument so they can give the lesson for that student and depending we have so many strings players on day one, for example, the advanced students might par participate in a lesson. Day two, <coughs> kids who are just starting out. So it, it varies, yeah. but it is just for those three grade levels because third grade is not currently, um, they don't take an instrument, per se, for band or strings. So are they missing one day? One day in the sixth day cycle. Okay. So pretty much every eighth day they miss a recess. Okay. Ideally it would be the day they have gym, but <laughs> with our schedule it doesn't yeah. allow that. All right. Well, that, thanks for the clarification. I think it's also just important to recognize too that it's not a situation where students are sitting at a desk for seven hours. Students are up and moving in the classroom. There is definite movement throughout the day. Thank you. Okay, other uh, questions that members of the committee have? No, sir. No, I don't have any. Okay, <coughs> do I have a motion to approve a second reading? of the wellness policy. You and me, Chris. Well, <laughs> I guess the only question I have is do we feel that Jeff's concerns have been addressed? Yeah. Because uh, I don't want to approve so I know he's, you know he's not here, but uh, I don't want to approve something and then, you know, well. he comes and feels that it wasn't addressed. So if we use our best judgment and say that we feel that it was addressed, then perfect well I think I think it is I mean okay. you know based upon principal O'Brien's comments but, and you know we have in very bold print here you cannot be withheld that, that, is true. that you know 
We, the data reassess period cannot be withheld as a consequence of behavior. So, mm -hmm. I, I think we are addressing it. Um, I think the issue in regard to um, you know the specials in the in the programs uh, that the kids are doing with the strings, you know, that's with the parents' consent. And uh, I, I think it's be because of that and the fact that it is instructional um, in nature that uh, we're doing our, the best that we can uh, to accommodate you know, the, all of the needs of the kids. And there's nothing, even if we approve this tonight, there's nothing to preclude us from at revisiting it at no. any time. Right. right. I think. I think it's hard. I mean, I've been over this wellness policy three or four times. I've read through it specifically. I made specific suggestions to Patty and said, remove this. Mm -hmm. I suggest changing this. Yeah. I think if Jeff has specific comments about how to increase the content relative to physical activity, he should make those suggestions. But I think absent any, <coughs> you know, a vague suggestion is just not something we can act on. And right. I think we should get this approved for the start of the school year. Right. Uh, I, yeah. No, I I agree. I, I think since particularly since we don't have another meeting until and after. And if Jeff doesn't watch the recording, <laughs> I'll just tell him when I see. <laughs> 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 nope. Just want to make sure we're all in agreement yeah. that we were satisfied. No, I agree. All right. All right. So I move to accept the second read of the wellness policy. Second. All in favor? Yes. Yes. And yes. So it's unanimous. All right. So we will have that in place for the beginning of school. All right. Uh, school choice policy. We have a second read on that. In your <coughs> handbook there, or in your packet there, page 28. Well, I move to accept the School choice policy, second read, JFBB. A second. All right. If there's no further discussion, Nicole, how do you vote? Yes. Yes. And yes, so it's approved. Next item is a uh, tuition waiver. Request. You have a letter here. Uh, so you have a you have a request for S H to um, be accepted as a kindergarten student in the Mashpee schools with a tuition waiver for school year So I guess the question uh, I have on this is when we went back and revisited the school choice seats based upon the classroom size, et cetera, um, <coughs> it was determined that we could accommodate two uh, additional students at that time and unfortunately we had more applicants than we had uh, seats available. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm assuming that we're still in that same situation that um, based upon our latest census that um, you know the classroom size is what we originally anticipated and that this would increase that. Is that correct? So we currently have, um, or at least I think it was as of last week, 120 students enrolled for kindergarten. We did move some personnel around to create a seventh kindergarten because 
20 is too high for kindergarten, so right now it's 18, maybe 18.5. Um, so that's the situation. We are not seeking to add any choice seats. You can't create choice seats specific to a scenario, to so right. no. Okay. I mean, we like 18 in a class size. That's a good number. Okay. Because otherwise we would have increased our choice seats. Okay. Yeah, so given that, um, what Patty had just addressed, and then also with the fact that pretty much, if I'm not mistaken, all of the tuition waivers in the past have been people that have lived in Mashby, moved out, wanted to just finish the school year, not brand new students. <coughs> um, and, you know, we do have open and closed dates on school choice. Unfortunately, not everybody gets in. Um, you know, once you do any kind of preferential treatment or special treatment for one, then it opens the floodgate. So I would, uh, I would make a motion to deny the tuition waiver um, for um, SH, SH and kindergarten for 2017-18. Okay. I'll go ahead and second that just for uh, discussion purposes. I know yeah. you have comments, so. Have we not done it before? Not to my recollection, we have not done a waiver for someone um, who was not <coughs> me. currently a student. Is that correct? We actually had one last year. We um, did? For a teacher at the Coombs School. Oh, okay. I stand corrected then. I don't know. <coughs> that was a little bit of a different circumstance, though. I believe. Because we did not else. have school choice seats, period, in that grade level. That is correct. Um, there were no no seats available in that grade level last year. So how is that different? Because nobody applied. Yeah. So if we have oh, seats, everybody else that applied or wants to now apply mm -hmm. can say, well, you had seats, you let one person, so <coughs> but there were no seats, period. So nobody applied, nobody could apply last year. Okay. Right. Which, which is part of the reason why you made the exception. Well, why we made the exception then, but also why we revisited school choice um, quite a bit this year. In terms of leaving seats open and stuff. Like trying that. to trying mm -hmm. to trying to make sure that we had as many seats as we could uh, optimally accommodate. And initially having seats in, in every grade level. All right. Where last year we did not have choice seats. Yeah, I was a little, um, I, I was a little confused by the request because I didn't understand how we could grant a waiver for a seat we don't have. So, can well, it's not a choice seat. It's just, can this child attend the Mashpee schools without having to pay the per pupil the tuition that would be, could be charged? But that. Okay, but if he were a choice student, that would be paid by his district. Right. You know, the five thousand mm -hmm. dollars. So in this case, you don't get the choice funding, and you don't get the average pupil cost. Right, but this would be uh, theoretically then anybody who didn't get into choice could just start applying for a tu to could apply for a tuition waiver. That's correct. Okay which you said there were seven who did not get in and that has a cost associated with that right <coughs> okay which is exactly pretty much my only concern yeah you know. yeah i understand now i mean it's it's not the optimum solution but um yeah i think from a practicality standpoint the one that we have to to go with a and treat everyone fairly mm -hmm. now I think understanding all that 
with that context, I think it makes sense. And the student would be able to um, apply next year for school choice again. And would have preference given that a sibling did get accepted for grade three. Right, if there's seats available. All right, so we have a motion um, to deny the request. So I have a second. You second yeah, it. And I second it. Any further discussion? No. How do you vote? So I'm voting yes to deny. Okay. Right. Yes. And yes. So it's unanimous. Double negatives. <laughs> yes. We're, de we're denying the request. <coughs> All right. All right. Any, um, any other items that uh, committee members wanted to bring forward, uh, subcommittee reports, et cetera, at this point? No. I will get together with you tomorrow, though, because I'm attending the FinCom meeting for George. Oh, yes. So if we have anything to report or anything I'd, you want me to report. Well, the only, uh, which I shared with the administrators at the town department head meeting last Wednesday of last week, um, town manager Collins told all of us that it was, he was looking for a level service budget not a level funded because someone specifically asked that so level service and i know the time frame is um, the principals have to have theirs to paul funk by august 22nd and then there's a much earlier time frame so at least, at least initially it's level service okay, he's a featured Presenting. agenda item on tomorrow oh. so well, okay. <laughs> i'm hoping to get more details on that okay, okay. and you did mention that our title one funding for FY18 has been decreased by 40,000? Yeah, about 40,000. How about the Title 2A? Title 2A was also cut by uh, maybe 15? And Title 2A um, in this district is used to support um, a teacher um, so in order to have smaller class sizes. So there's a specific teacher that every year is in that grant. So, so that's 55,000? I'm guessing on the 15. Uh, okay, ru ru <laughs> I'll, I'll hold you to it. But. So roughly 55,000 fewer dollars. fewer dollars than what we originally anticipated in our level funded budget or supporting our level funded budget because these are uh, grants that are not part of the uh, town appropriation but pay expenses uh, for the uh, education of our students and operation uh, of our school. So if it, we don't get it from one place, it's gonna have to come from the other side. Okay. Okay. That's, hopefully that's the end of that bad news. Well, <laughs> not thinking it's gonna be. Still, <laughs> still early, still early. There's going to be fewer and fewer federal dollars level. coming mm -hmm. from the federal I agree. Can I share one more thing? Yep. So I just want to share out that we had a little school committee retreat last Wednesday at the Riddle Room, <laughs> which was um, fun and interesting. It re required teamwork, and um, everybody sort of had pockets of strength that showed at different times. So we did make it out of the room, and it was uh, a good experience together as a team. So And our chairman? Turn the lights on. He so did. That yes, he yes. Did. Thank yes. goodness yeah. he came when he did because yeah. that was a rather. Can I say too that that was my first day of work? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that Part of the <laughs> initiation. <laughs> but we got it. We got it. it was I was good. just a little concerned that you guys were stuck in the dark. So <laughs> maybe we were enjoying it. <laughs> you know. George, George, yeah, get over here, George. We need the flashlight. <laughs> Oh, that's great. Anyway, yeah, good. That was good. And two good. and a half minutes to spare. Uh, yeah. Uh, exactly. Yeah. So. It was good teamwork. Yeah. Good, good, good thing uh, MTV was not there <laughs> <laughs> for that one. All right. Uh, if there's nothing else, um, we are going to be going into executive session. 
um, for purposes, for two purposes. One to uh, discuss strategy regarding uh, litigation, and also to discuss strategy in respect to bargaining with uh, Unit A. We will not return <coughs> to general session uh, after um, that executive session. I see it starred on here. It should not be starred on here. As I don't Where believe that? that there's a, a vote required. Oh yeah, no, there's no votes. So there, there will be no votes in executive session. Um, but we will not be returning uh, from uh, executive session. So uh, do I have a... a uh, so moved. Okay. I second. All in favor? Yes. Yes. And yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.